Are you concerned about your droopy eyebrows? Well, in this segment, we're going to cover all the treatments for treating eyebrows that have gotten droopy with age and sometimes with genetics. Well, there are some non-surgical options, and the main one is called all therapy. All therapy is an FDA-approved treatment uh, that is FDA-approved to actually tighten the skin of the forehead, helping the eyebrows to look a bit lifted. Okay, and so the idea behind this treatment is not so much an actual lifting like we do with surgery, but a tightening of the skin of the forehead. All therapy utilizes ultrasound to heat up the deep skin to cause that skin and the collagen to contract. And by contracting that collagen, it causes the skin to tighten and to get a bit of a lift of the eyebrow. And it's the only FDA approved non-surgical skin tightening treatment that I know of, um, and it definitely works. Now the thing with all therapy, and I'll just let you know, we don't offer all therapy in my practice. We do refer out to other practices if you are considering all therapy. So feel free to contact the office and we can give you a referral uh, to a good doctor in our area that does all therapy. But my concern with all therapy is a couple. is It is fairly, um, it can be fairly painful for some patients. And so typically it's tolerated, but it's not the easiest thing to tolerate. And there may be a bit of a variety of results with it. There are some patients who get great results from all therapy, and I've seen those results firsthand. But I've also had some patients that have had it done and have been less than um, happy with the results that they've gotten. So if you're thinking about all therapy for a brow lift, it's FDA approved for it. It definitely works. Uh, but you want to look at the before and afters and talk to that doctor in depth about what um, you can expect for your results. But if you're thinking about something that's non-invasive, then all therapy as a brow lift is a very reasonable option. Well, in our office, we do a lot of Botox that can arch a brow, okay? So there is a difference between lifting a brow and arching the brow. And, and the way I wanna describe it is, okay, is if we do a brow lift and we lift, the entire brow is lifted up. If, and you can do that, like I said, you get a minor lift if you do all therapy, but you can get a bigger lift if you do surgery. With Botox, you're not technically lifting the brow, but you're causing the brow to arch more um, visibly, okay? So if you look at the uh, patient here uh, on the screen, uh, you'll see that her, her brow is fairly flat in the left photo, and in the right, it arches much more, and it looks as if she may be a bit lifted. Well, in reality, it's that the brow itself has been arched. And so if you're the type of person that has a pretty flat eyebrow, you can get an arching of the eyebrow, which can really, um, for some people, help them look more open. However, if you already have an arching of the eyebrow, but they're kind of low, then Botox probably isn't going to work very well for you because it's just going to over arch your brows. And that's something that you do see sometimes in uh, celebrities where you go, well, why do they look like they're angry or like Cruella de Vil uh, or, you know, these types of Disney type cartoons. Uh, and the reason probably is that they already had a reasonable arch to their eyebrow and now they've Botoxed it or used another neurotoxin and that has caused it to become even more accentuated. Okay, so really if you're thinking about Botox to change your brows, it will help your brow to arch but not necessarily lift it. It's good if you've got horizontal eyebrows. Hopefully that hopefully that's clear for you. Well now let's go to surgery. Okay, the surgery that I perform by far most commonly to, to lift the brow is called an endoscopic brow lift. This is a surgery that basically uh, we perform it under general anesthesia so you're completely asleep. I make five little incisions behind the scalp and then I use a um, fiber optic camera and uh, different uh, uh, different uh, instruments to basically lift the skin up off of the frontal bone or your forehead bone. I will then release the connections that are holding your eyebrows down and that allows the brows to pull up. And then through the two small incisions behind the scalp, basically here and here, we'll put a little implant called an endotine. This is an, a bioabsorbable implant that lasts about three to four months. And it's kind of like a carpet tack. Um, so it really hooks in literally to the bone there, and it's like a little carpet tack with these little prongs that stick out. We then lift the skin up of the forehead and then press on those tines, that carpet tack, to engage it. And that endotine kind of carpet tack device will keep the eyebrows elevated uh, so that it heals in a higher position. Okay, so just to, you know, this is 
a lot of details here, but just to start over again, five little incisions behind the scalp. Uh, utilizing endoscopic instruments, we lift the scalp the, uh, off of the forehead bone, release the connections holding the eyebrows down, as well as sometimes divide some of the muscles in here that can create these types of uh, wrinkles in the uh, glabella or between the eyes. And then we lift the forehead skin up, put the two little endotine carpet tack implants in, engage them, and allows it to heal in a higher position. After that, I do put tiny little skin staples in the incisions, and we do put a little drainage tube that just stays in overnight. Now, uh, the surgery itself takes about an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, it's very common to have some um, bruising uh, and a little bit of discomfort afterwards. Now, what are the risks of an endoscopic brow lift? The first thing that I tell my patients, if you're thinking about an endoscopic brow lift, is that uh, the results can be a little unpredictable. I've had some patients that we do endoscopic brow lifts and their brows are in perfect position and they stay that way and we're so happy. I've had other patients that we've done endoscopic brow lifts and in the end we haven't been um, completely happy with where their brow ended up. Typically the brow, because the body heals by contraction with an endoscopic brow lift, we divide these connections to release them, to lift it up, but your body as it heals may try to to heal it by contracting it and pulling the brow back down, and in some people it does a little bit. Uh, in that case, sometimes we end up with a brow that's lower than we want it to be ideally. Uh, in order to prevent that, we do recommend Botox injections to the glabella, to this area, uh, at least a week if not more prior to the endoscopic brow lift, and that will also help prevent you from doing this and kind of pulling those eyebrows down as we want them to heal in a higher direction. So I tell my patients afterwards, uh, always think up, always think up afterwards because we want the brow to heal in that higher position. So the first risk, really the main one, is that your brows may not be in the position that we would ideally like them to be in if it, if it doesn't, um, or if the body, let's say, contracts with the healing and we don't get quite the lift we're hoping for. Uh, other risks that you can get bleeding and infection, those are very unusual, but you can get a bit of a blood collection. Um, that's always a possibility. Uh, we always watch out as well for potential nerve injury. Okay, now endoscopic brows have a much lower risk of numbness and other types of nerve injury than the traditional brow lifts, but there's always a risk of injury where you can get permanent or temporary numbness. Uh, there's also a nerve that comes up this part of the face that helps you lift up your eyebrows, and if that nerve is damaged, then that can cause you not to be able to lift up your brow. Uh, very, very rare to injure a motor nerve like that and to create a problem like that. Uh, other risks you can get uh, where the incisions are. Some people can get little areas where they lose hair. Usually that is temporary. Uh, the hair can go into a phase for three to four months where it just doesn't grow, but eventually does grow in. Um, and you can get fluid collections, and those are kind of the main things uh, that we see. And, and during a consultation face-to-face, -face, we'll go over more of those potential risks with you. So what's the recovery like for an endoscopic brow lift? The recovery typically is not that bad. So the surgery, like I said, is about an hour and a half to two hour surgery. It's a general anesthetic, so you're complete the, uh, completely asleep the whole time. Uh, after surgery, when you wake up, there'll be those five little incisions with the little skin staples there. There'll be a little drainage tube coming out from the side which we will take out the next day. I don't typically put wraps or anything on your face after the endoscopic brow lift. You may have a little bit of blood in your hair, um, and uh, typically then you head home afterwards if this is the only procedure that you're having done at the time. Uh, you can shower and gently wash your hair two days after surgery. So after surgery two days later, perfectly fine to get in the shower. Uh, make sure if you're the type of person that gets lightheaded in the shower, you have somebody with you just in case you're not feeling right. But you can take a shower, you can gently wash your hair. Uh, I don't recommend using a brush um, for several weeks. Use your fingers and always go from a front to back direction. Front to back, because what you don't want to do is dislodge those carpet tack endotines and cause the brow to drop. So front to back, two days after surgery, you can wash the blood and stuff out of your hair at that time. Then you come back to see us at, a, at uh, typically one week after surgery. At one week, we'll take out about two-thirds, one half to two-thirds of the staples. Make sure everything looks good. Um, the drainage tube, if I didn't mention earlier, comes out after one day. Okay, so typically you come back to the office on post-op day number one to take those drains, that, that drain out. 
At one week, you have the majority of your skin staples removed. Uh, the rest of them are removed at two weeks. Typically, people do get some bruising. Believe it or not, even though we don't operate on your under eyes, bruising comes from the forehead and moves down. So you may find a week or two after surgery, you're going to have some bruising of your lower eyelids, believe it or not, even though we don't do anything to them. You'll probably have a bit of a headache right after surgery. You may take a handful of pain pills the first few days at most, but most people are off pain pills after just a couple of days. Um, so once again, at two weeks, uh, the rest of the skin staples are removed. Um, you can start exercising typically at three weeks. Now, it will take uh, anywhere from six to eight weeks for most of your swelling to go away, and it can take four to six months for all of your swelling to go away. And those scars can take really six to 12 months for those scars to completely mature. And I mentioned earlier that you may have a little area where you lack uh, hair growth for a few months as well. So final result can take four to six months. Usually people look pretty presentable within a week or two, and they most of the time look good within two to three weeks. So keep that in mind. It will take anywhere from two to three weeks for most people to really look in the mirror and say, wow, I really look good. So, so that's the gist of the endoscopic brow lift. For those of you who are looking for a true brow lift, this is what I do and pretty much all of my patients. One thing I also want to throw in there that I didn't mention earlier is that an endoscopic brow lift will move your hairline back by about a centimeter or so. Okay, And so if you have a high hairline already, that may not make you a good candidate for a, an endoscopic brow lift. If your hairline, however, is relatively low on your forehead, then that's a good thing because we can move it back by about a centimeter and it won't affect your appearance all that much. But once again, if you've got thinning hair up front or if your hair has already really receded quite a bit, that's why endoscopic brow lifts are not great options in most men. Um, you you want to reconsider whether the surgery may be the right one for you. And that's something that I can go over with you uh, in a face-to-face -face consultation. Here's an example of a patient who underwent an endoscopic brow lift, and you can see that her brows are definitely low. She's got some heaviness of her eyelids beforehand, and afterwards, they're just opened up. Um, she doesn't look surprised, but she looks alert and awake. Another example of a patient who underwent an endoscopic brow lift, she looked kind of grumpy on her before picture, and the endoscopic brow lift combined with a little Botox in the glabella, which is this area, really helped to soften her appearance and lift those brows up and, and make her look more pleasant. And another patient who underwent an endoscopic brow lift, sometimes the brow lift results are fairly subtle. They're not super, super dramatic, but as you can see, really helped to open up her eyes. She also had a lower facelift and some fat injections as well. Well, what about the open brow lift? The open brow lift is uh, more uh, is an older surgery, uh, still being practiced by a lot of surgeons out there. There are some surgeons that don't believe that an endoscopic brow lift works all that well, and so they still do the open brow lifts. And the gist of this surgery, and I honestly haven't done one in over 12 years, is that you make a cut through the scalp from ear to ear, or sometimes people will make it in the front of the scalp, then lift the um, forehead skin off of the forehead bone, divide those connections really like we do in an endoscopic brow lift, but this you divide it literally right in front of you, sometimes rem removing a little bit of muscle through the uh, glabella, which is this area, pulling everything back, and then removing a strip of scalp or a strip of forehead skin, depending on where your scar is, and then typically stapling it shut all the way across. Um, yes, this is a big operation. It sounds kind of scary because it is a little bit scary. Uh, this is a procedure, however, that really, really does work. Um, but it's quite invasive. The concerns that I have with this operation are bald areas because of such a long, long incision, uh, higher risk of uh, numbness as well, and it's just it's harder to recover from. So I haven't performed one of these in quite a long time. I typically do recommend the endoscopic approach for almost all of my patients. Uh, the only negative, the only patient that may want to really seriously consider this is if you have a very high forehead, a high hairline, where you can shorten it by doing the open brow lift. But, but the problem, <coughs> excuse me, but the problem with that is that that scar in the front of your um, hairline can be very visible, and that's the bad thing, and that's why I don't typically recommend it. So, uh, well, these are your various options. If you've got droopy eyebrows, you've got the options. You can do something non-surgical like all therapy. 
you can consider Botox as a way to arch your brows, even though it's not a true lift, it's an arching, or you can consider the endoscopic brow lift. Uh, I hope that this was useful for you in your quest to treat your droopy eyebrows.